trust me that much? No. No, <laughs> Grandpa. <laughs> All right, here we go. Third verse for us, please come in the last verse. And. Souls in danger, love God, love. Jesus completely saves. He will lift you by his love out of the angry waves. He's the master of the sea. Billows his will obey. Be your Savior, wants to be. Exactly. We can be a whole lot more effective. Right? I'm just 
saying was worked for me in the past. All right, now, so that's back to Church Sunday. On the eighth, two weeks from today, uh, I'm already getting into different people's ear. My couple, three of my children that live in the area do not currently go to church right now. Well, that's a prayer request. So please pray for them. my family at the beginning. And uh, then the Lord's Supper is also going to be going to be on the eighth, and that's going to be during the morning worship service. And then one last important thing to note is the sun, during the Sunday school hour, the adult Sunday school class, um, we have been showing uh, a series of videos called Our American Heritage. The truth about our American heritage. Not what you've been, everyone here in this audience has been what I think is a victim to revisionist history. Because ever since the 1920s, people who have an agenda of trying to paint our country as not a Christian nation have been writing the history books. Not since 1980, not since 1990, but since the 1920s. So everyone here, I believe, went to school with textbooks from the 1920s on. Now think about that. Now we all heard about George Washington and, and chopping at the cherry tree, but I'm, not, I'm talking about what was the purpose of the founding of our country, the things like that that's all been whitewashed to facilitate a godless agenda of not expecting any kind of Christian influence in the American government at all. So, that's during the Sunday School Hour. Now, I, I was going to um, continue the Young Adult Sunday School class the first week after Labor Day, but I'm going to postpone that so we can all participate in the American Heritage videos. I've, I've watched them in the last three weeks. They're very good. It, it's, it's, it's not geared toward children. It's factual. It's a lot of content. So, however you gotta wake up, don't come bleary eyed. Come awake, come ready to learn. They're good. And they're well thought out and well prepared. Um, so, I wanna encourage you to make it a point to be here um, for, for at least the next couple of months. Uh, Mike said that there's several videos. I wouldn't be surprised if, if it makes it all the way through uh, Thanksgiving. So, so be a part of that. It'll be good. Uh, please take your hymnals and turn to hymn number. Turn over, please. 56. Hymn number 56, and please stand with me if you're able. Day by day. The theme for the verse that supports the song that this song comes from is 2nd second, uh, second Corinthians 12.9 where it says, My grace is sufficient to you. My power is made perfect in weakness. And it's, of course, it's implying our weakness. <laughs> right? His power is made perfect. So day by day. Day by day. Yeah. 
beginning of time, before the beginning of time. That did not strike me as very spectacular in my young age until I thought the Lord knew he was going to create the human race. And the human race would choose to sin. Okay. Yet, he still created us. Right. Knowing he would need to take full responsibility for that and send himself in the form of a baby to pay our debt. Okay. Jesus going to the cross was not an afterthought. Oh no, what do we do now, man? That was premeditated love. Dwell on that. Help me then in every tribulation so to trust your promises, O Lord, that I lose not faith's sweet consolation. This time frame 
was going up to about from 1517 to about 1700 AD. We want to look at the Sardis as a literal church sitting in Asia Minor. These were its characteristics, also characteristics of the church today. I want to show you as a recap, you can write some of these down. This is where the church in Rome, now understand something. Christianity isn't measured by Baptist, Lutheran, Presbyterian. It's measured by basically the church in Rome. And uh, it was back then, it was still the remnant that was there, God's remnant. But here, just, I wrote them up here. You can write these down if you'd like to. Some we've already gone over, uh, the, the praying for the dead, the uh, angel worship, uh, mass, the Mary, all these things uh, that were done uh, up to 995 AD. None of these things will you find in your Bible. Do we get that? They're not in your Bible. If somebody says, well, this is what we do. Ask them. Show it to them in your Bible. I'll take you out further. If you want to write all of those down, and uh, you would like me to wait, yes. I probably, I could sing a song. Uh, I could do something. I might put a lot up there. Write them down as quickly as you can. When you get those done, we'll move on because I've got another list of another six items that were added on to that as well. Understand something. When man doesn't feel like hearing from God, they make up their own way. Right. It's why you have so many religions, so many branches of Christianity, so much that's going on, because somebody says, I've got an idea. You know, if somebody preaches something, you say, I've never heard this before, the first thing you do is close your ears. Yeah. There's nothing that hasn't been preached in the 2,000 years since Christ. There's nothing, Solomon said it, there's nothing new under the sun. Right? right? So we get that. So hopefully you got all those. If not, you see me right afterwards and I'll give you the rest. You can go. 998, they started the whole thing about Lent. Uh, a required fast in a, a 40 day period. Right. It was just an idea. So, hey, and I don't mind looking at Somebody says, look, I want to fast for 40 days. I think it's great. Some people need to fast for 40 days. But if you're going to fast for 40, that's fine. I don't mind that. But understand that. Don't make it a church doctrine. Right. Don't make it a church rule. Uh, we have this. Independent Baptist churches do this. Yeah. We come up with ideas that we think are whatever, and then we make it part of our doctrine. Uh, our doctrine is in this book, folks. And if our book doesn't support it, it's not doctrine. It might be a preference. It might be, I thought this is what I want, but I'm going to tell you something, we get more trouble when we make things, I, I was sharing something the other day, we were, we were word of life, and we weren't allowed to go to movies because they were bad. And then out came VHS. Now what? They would have been better off saying, listen, you need to guard your eyes and guard your ears and don't let evil things come in. Right. Doesn't matter if it's on HBO, Stars, the internet, whatever it might be, you don't let it in. Right? right? Be careful. By 1039, they told the priests they couldn't marry anymore. They came up with prayer beads by 1090. So people can wor worry beads. My Bible says to be anxious for nothing. Why do I need worry beads when God said don't worry? Am I right? Stay with me tonight, okay? Sale of indulgences. Uh, the Inquisition, you might remember what the Inquisition was. And so they went around and gathered up people like us who didn't follow the teachings in Rome and they put us to death. They went around, I know a lot of folks go to Florida and they go to Orlando and you waste all your money going to Disneyland and never go to the Holy Land experience. Right. I got an idea. Add God into your vacation song. How's that sound? Right? You know, instead of wasting all your money, you ought to go over there. There's a room where they have Bibles, and they have blood still on those Bibles. Because when they came in, and they found them uh, writing or reading or copying over a Bible, they would chop their heads off, they would chop their hands off, they'd chop their fingers off, they'd put them to death right there. 
it was actually at one point illegal for anyone who was not a priest to possess a Bible. See, well, that would never happen again. Yeah, be careful, folks. The sale of indulgences to get people out of uh, out of purgatory. First of all, there's no purgatory. You can't get around. Second of all, as soon as you die, you're judged. You say, "Would you pray for my dead son?" Not again. Then too late. I'll pray for you. Too late for them. And then the doctrine of transubstantiation came along. They took the Lord's Supper and said, rather than that just being a, a piece of bread, a bread and bread and some uh, uh, un, uh, uh, unfermented fruit or wine, uh, glass of grape juice, we're going to make it literally the body and blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. So not only were they killing him from 994, now we're going to make this whole thing about him. And by the way, I had some training to be an altar boy one time, and uh, one of those wafers dropped on the floor. Now he thought he thought the star quarterback on a team dropped his contact, okay? And everybody was on the floor, everybody was picking this thing up. There was a way to pick a wafer up off the floor. And uh, what really surprised me is when they got in the back room, they just threw the trash. Oh. Do you see any hypocrisy? I don't know, maybe you do, but yeah, I don't know if I do. This, I'm going to give you one more thing here tonight before we move into the next church. <laughs> because I, I spoke about the Great Reformation. And that it was good, except it didn't go far enough. The church didn't need reforming. It needed to be blown up and start over again. Right. There was still the remnant there. But there's, there's three things that, that these men, uh, Calvin, Williams, Knox, uh, uh, Luther, in specific, gave to us. And one, look at First Peter chapter two, verses five through nine. It's called the priesthood of believers. If you understand you have a high priest, that's the Lord Jesus Christ. And you're, you're, you're a priest within your home. A priest simply is one who guided people in the scriptures. Second Peter, chapter, first Peter, chapter two, verse five through nine. Ye also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house, and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable unto God, unto God by Jesus Christ. Tell me what the first acceptable sacrifice is. We read it last Sunday morning, Romans chapter 12. What is it? I beseech you, brother, by the mercies of God, which you present your bodies. Holy well, sacrifice, acceptable unto God. We're to offer ourselves as a sacrifice. A living sacrifice unto God. That means our ways, what we want, are pushed aside, and what we want is God's will in our life. Amen. It's funny, I, I, I spoke the last two weeks on distractions, and, and I was telling somebody today, I, I've never seen so many people distracted in the last two weeks. Right. You know, not church, waiting for what they're supposed to be, doing what they're supposed to be. I understand it's vacation time, but God hasn't changed. Right. And devil will use good things to distract you. There's no problem with that whatsoever. Verse 6, Wherefore also it contained in the Scriptures, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone. Who's our cornerstone? Jesus. Jesus Christ. Amen. Elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you, therefore, which believe, he is precious. But now to them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. And a stone is stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. But ye are a, here it is again, a what? A chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who had called you out of darkness into his Marvelous light. We're all of the seed of Abraham, the spiritual seed of Abraham. Do you understand today that those who are born Jews are, are less the child of Abraham than those of us that are saved? How do you like that one? Throw that past the Jews sometimes. My father is Abraham, right? Right? That's what the Bible says. That's our, our spiritual father here on earth. But the Jews, if they reject Christ, they reject Abraham, therefore they, they, they reject him. 
Number two, not only to give us the universal priesthood of all believers, that means, listen, there's priests in every single home. We are to take that position seriously. Number two, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. Here's the second thing that Luther gave us that we still hold on to. Chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. This is why some of the reasons he divided away. It was not a priest. You don't have to go to a priest to confess your sins. You don't come, don't you come to me and confess your sins. I can't do a thing for you. Now, if you want to come and we'll talk about what's going on in your life and uh, I'll counsel with you and I'll help you and do it, but I can't forgive sins. Right? Only God can forgive sins. All right? Yeah. Right? So, number two is right here. The Bible has a sole authority for believers. The church in Rome hated this because the sole authority basically was the papacy at this time. It was the Pope. It was the church in Rome. They told you how to run your family, what you can read, how to run the government, and everything else. They had lasting battles with kings in different places. I may not like a particular president or a senator. I'm not going to have a battle with them. My battle is with the devil. It's a spiritual battle. God needs to take care of him. He'll take care of him. But look at says, 2 Timothy chapter 3. All scripture. Genesis to Revelation, folks. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly finished unto all good works. The word of man fails, but the word of God is true. Understand this, and Peter talked about it as well in his epistle. God wrote the Bible. A lot of people argue with me about God. They write, our God write the Bible. I said, you know, we can, we can take a secretary. Can I still use that word? I don't know if that's, I can't. Okay, we can take an administrative assistant, okay, who sits at the seat of a CEO, and the CEO corresponds a message that they would like the administrative assistant to send out. Was that put it correct? I did well. Thank you. The boss gives the secretary the message that says, right, this Anyway, there you go, right? I, I know. Yeah. I, I got you, okay? But anyway, we can believe that that administrator assistant, is it, they still do shorthand? No. That nobody does that. I do it on your iPad or something like that, type it out or something. And, and I can never figure out shorthand. I played hockey, and I know our team was shorthand sometimes, but I don't know what the shorthand was. But anyway, they would write that down, huh? and, and they would get every word, they would write that down. We can believe that, but we can't believe God can correspond His word to the humans. Wow. we got a problem with our faith, don't we? He says every word, every word is given. God wrote the Bible and handed it down to His administrative assistants. Number three, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. Hey, we've got a little fun here, can we? Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. Here's the third thing he did. We've got it up here. His salvation is by faith alone and not of works. By the way, Martin Luther founded the Lutheran Church. So if you go to the Lutheran Church today, depending on what sign out you go to, you still have to work your way to heaven. It's still infant baptism to wash away that, what do they call that, initial sin, original sin, that's what they call it. And then from there, you have to follow the church and it's about being good, et cetera, et cetera. That's not what Luther believes. He believes in salvation by works, by faith, and faith alone and not of works. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. Revisionists come along all the time, don't they? For by grace are you saved through faith? And not of yourselves, it's a gift of God. Not of words, so I say to man should boast. And I love the next verse. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus on the good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So we see in this church of Sardis, during the Reformation period, there was teaching that was given that would help us even in our lives today. It takes us now quickly, I'm going to take you right past there. 
and I'm going to take you right over to this little map. And we know this little map. We've seen this little map. These are the seven churches that existed in Asia Minor. Philadelphia, you can see he's sitting uh, uh, right over here, right? There's Philadelphia, uh, close to Sardis. All of these were gathered very close together, uh, right south of Sardis, sat this church in the city of Philadelphia. We're going to go through this, but I want you to see something tonight. Remember where this church sat. It sat right in the middle of the church of Sardis, uh, Tyra, Ephesus, other churches. Every one of those churches had a condemnation, didn't they? Right? There was something they did wrong. But now take a look at the church in Philadelphia. Go back to your Bibles. Go back to the book of Revelation, chapter 3. And let's pick it up from here. Revelation chapter 3, verse 7. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. Who's speaking? Who's he speaking of? This is Jesus Christ speaking about himself. He is the holy and true one. He does hold the keys. I know thy works. Do you know the Lord Jesus watches this church? He doesn't need Facebook or YouTube or any Wi-Fi or whatever that new thing that's coming out or whatever it is. God is here. Our Lord and Savior is here. He watches what's going on. He sits right next to every one of us and he knows when you're writing your grocery list. He knows when you're playing a game on your computer. He even knows when your thoughts go someplace else. He knows everything. Remember, he's omniscient, right? Now, the best thing to do is to listen, put the toys away, and let God work. Amen? Sir? Who are the dead in Christ? We'll come back to them. Which one? You know why the Bible speaks of the dead in Christ? You said that you were afraid of the dead. The dead in Christ are those who are saved. That's right. They're not. That's right. right. Believe in, in, in the Lord Jesus. Yeah, right. Yeah. But you don't pray, you don't pray for the dead in Christ. Right. That yeah, doesn't do any good. Pray for the dead in Christ and already with Christ. That's right. How much better do they get it than being with Christ, right? right? right. Yeah. So what if they're your, your relatives? I mean, you don't pray for your fathers? No, oh, they're in heaven. Why do I pray for my father? He's in heaven. He's praying. If nothing else, he's telling angels, hey, go help that guy. He needs help. He's up in heaven. He's up in heaven. He's there rejoicing with our Savior. Amen? Amen. Yeah. There's no communication back and forth. I said, well, they can look out in heaven and see what we're doing. No, they don't. But why in the world? But some would want to look down on this sinful earth from here in heaven. Right. Would you want to do it? I tell you what they are doing. They're waiting and watching for their loved ones to come. Yes. And some are waiting and hoping that somebody will go. Remember that the rich man in hell that lifted up his voice and looked tell my brothers? I believe there's people in heaven who say, hey, I, I, need my, I need my son, I need my daughter, I need my wife, I need my friend to be saved. Send an angel. I know that works, verse 8. Behold, I have set before thee an open door. You ought to underline that in your Bible. We'll get to it. And no man can shut it, for thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews, and are not, but do I. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world, to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Him that overcometh thy make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my the name of my God and the name of the city. Of which my, of God, my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, I will write unto him my new name. 
he that hath an ear. Let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. So we come here and, and we see this. We saw the last church age, which is the Reformation time. Now we look at this particular church. There was a time in the Reformation when it started hot and ended up icy cold. By the way, a lot of the churches start that way. They start hot and end up icy cold. They said that you know, baptism and whatnot was the, the, the way to have they, they, they compromise things. Now, I'm going to show you some things today as we look through this time period about 1700 to 1900 going back and forth between this church as it existed and this time frame leading up to 1900s called the remnant or the revival, she said the revival church. Watch what happens. There was one thing missing in this letter to this church sitting in Philadelphia. What was it? What was not there? There was no condemnation. Of the seven churches, this is the only church where God would not bring out something that was wrong with that church. By the way, we get to the next one, we don't find anything right with it. That's the church age we live in today. We look at this, and uh, a few things about Philadelphia, just to let you know. Philadelphia means brotherly love. We'll get into that a little bit as we go through this. It was a center of, of Greek culture. Established around 200 BC, uh, this city was attacked, burned, attacked, burned. It's about 30 miles southeast of Sardis, and it's known for its line of fine wines. That's what the secular city of Philadelphia was known for. By the way, these timbers that you see here, these old ones, those are still sitting there. If you were to go to Philadelphia today in uh, Asia Minor, this is what you would see. And you can see ruins of uh, a city that was once there. You see their background. The city of Brotherly Love. Let's keep going along here. And I, Kind of pasted this up there for you. It was they had a huge Jewish population. A lot of Jews had settled in this area. In 17 AD, it was destroyed by an earthquake. In fact, they were kind of the California of Asia Minor. You know, people say, oh, those poor people in California, that their house was on a cliff and they had an earthquake. First of all, if you're building a house in an earthquake zone, where don't you build it? You don't put it on a cliff. It's like the folks down in New Orleans when Katrina hit and all that flooding. You know why? Because they built their houses in what? Under sea level. Under sea level. In a floodplain. If you don't want your house to flood, don't build your house in a floodplain. Does that make sense? Sometimes this thing up here doesn't work too well to too many people. You know, if I want to know if they can get flood insurance, no wonder they couldn't get flood insurance. Uh -huh. Meaning the insurance companies are smarter than they were. Her brother, her lady, her father, her sister, uh, many times it was destroyed by earthquakes, natural disasters. Uh, one of the emperors would rebuild the city once it was destroyed. So understand something, Tiberius Caesar, uh, one of the Caesars would, would rebuild this. Understand what I want you to get from this is this city and the people who lived in it went through many struggles and many tribulations. So we think, well, they must have had no problems at all, no issues at all. That's why they stayed true. Uh, quite contrary, I'm not sure it did not happen that way. So let's take a look at this church, and there's a commendation. This is seen as a, a faithful church, faithfully doing exactly what God wanted them to do. We want to be a faithful church. Let's go back and copy the church in Philadelphia. They didn't worry about activities and all these kind of things. We do those things, and maybe they did those too. But the most important thing for them to do was to preach the word and profess Christ to all the world. Isn't that what most important for us to be? Yeah, I'm not a real fan of Facebook and YouTube. But I'm going to tell you something. If I get the word out there and more people can hear, that's good. The more you hear, the better. But I like it in the church after there, there is no substitute for being in the house of God. Right. Well, we get to fellowship with each other. 
we get to hear things and do things that nobody, if they're not here, they don't get to do those things. We get to participate in serving. Uh, do you love our ushers? They get younger and younger, aren't they? And uh, I had one here, but he got in a little bit later. So, uh, but uh, I've got these, these, these three young men here. They're going to join up with John. They're going to they're usher. And uh, I love that. We're going to train them up, right? Amen. I was trying to get men to wear usher badges. I told these guys where they were. And those three young people, they ran back to the camp and got their usher bucks. They're proud to be an usher. Amen. Serve the Lord. Huh? You, you, can, you said it all. You can't be an usher. You don't even get to participate unless you give, give a fee or something in our tithes and offerings to support the church. You ought to be here. And I understand some people are ill and they can't get out. And that's one of the reasons we have this. But I love the church. It's a place where, where focuses and this church focused on what it was supposed to do. Boy, it's easy to get distracted. I've had people come to me and say, well, tell me about your youth group. Well, tell me about your music. Well, tell me about your ladies group. Tell me about you. Tell me about you. Tell me about you. Why don't you ask me what we do? We preach the Word. Amen. Amen. We preach the Word. We practice biblical separation. And we strive every way we can by prayer and speaking to people who win souls to Christ. That's what we're about. Right. Everything else is the thrills on the side. You know, they didn't have too many thrills in Philadelphia. They didn't much of anything. They preached the Word. I love that song. You know, preach the Word. Preach the cross. Preach redemption to the lost. They, as Nike would say, they just do it. And the challenge to them in verse 11 of your text is listen. Keep doing what you're doing. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Keep doing what you're doing. Keep doing what you're doing. You know, one day, the Bible talks about five crowns that every believer is going to get. If they earn those crowns. No welfare system in heaven. No participation crowns in heaven. Don't you hate participation crowns? Yeah. Right? You know, when I was in my play Little League, we lost the World Series. We didn't get anything. The other team got a trophy and all that. We got nothing. We didn't win. We didn't deserve anything. Right? right. Not kids just show up. Well, we don't hurt the little tiny little feelings. And look at the mess we've made. Another yep. message, another day. The challenge is keep going. Keep that great reward that you're going to get. Keeping the word doesn't mean just believing it, folks. It's obeying it and doing it. The church in Philadelphia went out and did it. And I'm going to share some things here briefly for you, and probably more of these as we get into our, our mission month and our revival month, about those that did exactly that. You can see characterized between the 1700s and the 1900s a tremendous spread of Christianity around the world. And you're going to see how it happened. They were told, just do it. They openly proclaimed Christ. The condemnation, there was none. There was a book I read once, I think it was by a man named Kim Blanchard. And I always remember this one part. He says, catch someone doing something right. We need that today. Yeah, yeah. Because, man, we're quick to catch somebody doing something wrong. Yeah. Right? By the way, parents and grandparents, it's a great philosophy when you're raising kids. Because I know this, that when somebody is commended for what they've done, they will strive to do even more. God made us. We like the words. How do we like the words? Who likes the words? We all like those. How do we earn those? But we, we like to be rewarded. I mean, you go to work and they say, hey, we're handing out a bonus of $1,000. How many would like it? Well, not me. I really don't like the words. You put my name on a check and send it here and we'll take care of it. We'll put it towards a demand. Okay? That money is so evil. Listen to me. But we, we, we look at this, we need to commend. And God commends His church. There's no condemnation. We ought to catch more people doing stuff right and encourage them to do right. I, as your pastor, can preach to myself on that one to help you. Here's what He tells me. Here's the counsel. He says, follow the holy and the true one. Our Bible tells us that that we ought to be holy for because God is holy. Our Lord is holy. 
when we follow selling it as holy, how should we live? Oh, that's what he's telling us. It's not just, just follow him and see where he's going. It's follow what his teachings. That's what Christianity is. It's a literally, by definition, a follower of Christ. It's just not someone who uh, uh, off the side, well, yeah, I, I live in a Christian nation or whatever it might be. It's a follower of Christ. We are to be followers of Christ. But this made this church so, so usable. In the corresponding church age is they would practice biblical separation. They would stand for what was right and they would, they would hate that which is evil. We've kind of fallen in love with that which is evil. Or one guy say one time, we just simply stay one head step ahead of the world. Right? There's stuff, I guarantee you, there's stuff you watch on television that people at this time would call you the greatest sinner they ever knew. God's unchangeable. The great commentator, uh, uh, J. Vernon B. wrote it this way. Christ reminds him that he is holy. Holy at his birth. Holy at his death. Holy at his present priestly office. He is likewise true. I am the truth. Isn't that what he said? I am the way, the truth, and the life. True means genuine with an added note of perfection and completeness. He also had the key of David. Back in Isaiah 22, 22, there's a, a man named Eliakim. He's a type of Christ who held the key. Jesus holds the key to the throne of David. One day, the new Jerusalem is coming, folks. The devil will be gone. There will be no sin. But we'll spend eternity with our Lord. Amen. Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Amen? Amen. Amen. I'm ready. You ready? Yes. I'm ready. Even so, come quickly. On Him, on all the glory of the Father's house. He said this is different from the keys of Hades and death. This speaks to the royal, regal claim to the ruler of the universe. Who will sit upon the throne of David in his millennium. He will be sovereign. He will reign forever. He says, look at Follow the holy and true one. Stay true. He's the keeper of the keys. That's who we have to follow. When Jesus opens the door, now look at verse 8. Here's the challenge. Jesus said, I am the door. John 10, uh, 7 through 9, right? He speaks to us fishers. Here we look here. He says, I set before thee what? An open door. I love it. You know, when, when, when Jesus opens the door, you know the funny thing about open doors? Because you really don't know how long they're going to stay open, do you? Okay? If I push this door and say, okay, everybody can get out, get out, before the door closes. But I don't very long, is it? Right? During this time frame, God would open doors for these churches to preach and spread the gospel. I believe set before us is an open door. Yeah. It's called the United States of America. It's called Ypsilanti. It's called Milan. It's called Kent. It's called Clinton. It's called whatever other city might be out there, Belgium. That's what it's called. That's an open door. Amen. He said, I've opened up a door for you. You are free to go out without government restrictions and, and talk to people about Christ. You can do that, you know. Amen. You can go out and, and share Christ with the world. You can, you can go out and minister to people. There's an open door. Do you understand that in Asia Minor, there was an open door and that door closed? I don't know how much longer our door will stay open. When God says we're done, we're done. I'm hoping it's not in my lifetime. Break my heart to see America fall spiritually and fall below. Understand something today. We look at this. He's the open door. There's an open door. He will conquer our enemies. He says, "Look at you go. I'll take care of your enemies." I told you before. A man in my my school. His name was Bob Goodman. Bob Goodman has since uh, passed away. He graduated with me, but he was a big guy. I don't know if my wife remembers him or not. But this guy was big. 
He had a huge bigger than me. Pardon? But I'm going to tell you, I was as muscular then as I am now. And I remember, I think it was his math I helped him with. He was really struggling. I said, well, I love it. You know, I mean, I, I, I was like, you know, Timmy sitting next to Steve back there, okay? You know, there was like a big difference in size between us, but it didn't matter because I had something that could help him. And he, he passed, I think he, he passed half of the seat, but he failed everything else. But he passed that, okay? It's the only class I had with him. I helped him, he passed. And I remember one day coming from the band and heading back, and there's a couple guys that, that didn't like me for a reason, I'm sure. And they kind of pushed me up against the wall and it came by. And he came in, he got in between, he says, you want him to come through me first. Okay. He said, if I ever see you do that again, you'll be finding your teeth on the ground. <laughs> but you know something? He, he fought my enemies for me. Right. You know what God does? God takes care of your enemies. Right. God takes care of those who are against you. He says, I want you to go. You just go and I'll take care of the enemies. I'll push people out of the way that are standing in your way. I, I, I'll make sure you can talk to them. I'll take care of this. I'll take care of that. Just go. Just do it. The church in Philadelphia, they just went. They went. Do you, you notice where they were? They were sitting amongst all these churches that were kind of all cold and dead and, and, and not much there. They weren't that far from out of sea. But they didn't care what the other churches were doing. They had something they were supposed to do. Let's go do what God has called us to do. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now, let's go do what God called us to do. Amen. 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 That's what we need to do. Let's be what He wants. He set before them an open door. And every door, Colossians 4, 3 tells us, every door we go through, before you go through it, you lift it up in prayer. I was looking today at our, our, our sheet and uh, our, our uh, What's that thing called? The bulletin. We start out at 7.30 in the morning with prayer. Right? We have Wednesday prayer. We have times with prayer. We have a prayer 24 hour clock. This church believes in prayer. Amen. Amen. You do nothing without prayer. You do nothing without the Lord. You'll, you'll just get frustrated. The battle is the Lord's. The challenge here, now watch what he tells them. Here's your, here's your promise. I'll keep you from the hour of temptation. When I read 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18, I believe this. I believe God's going to call the church out before the tribulation time comes. He will call us out. True believers will go. Just as He took His believers out when He destroyed the, the, the world with, the, the, during Noah's flood. It's called, we call it the rapture. The word rapture is not in the Bible, but it needs to be, to be caught up which we take from Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. I mean, I agree with that. That's fine. I'm separate because of that, but that's, that's what I believe. Sometimes I joke and I say, God will take you whenever you believe you're supposed to go. Mm -hmm. So all those that believe you're going to go at the end of the tribulation, he's going to let you go all the way through it. But anyway, we're called out. He promises his church, you're not going to go through it. He promises believers, you're not going to go through that. I don't want to go through it. You want to go through it? Time for the Holy Spirit's going to move. I, I don't want to go through this. We need to make a decision. He says in verse 12, he says, you'll be, you'll be strong, you'll be respected. And I'm going to give you something here because I can't get into all of it. But this, I've got three minutes. Where does time go? All over Europe. All over Europe, into China. I'm going to show you some men today. And then we're going to get deeper into these as we go through our, 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 our mission time and our revival time. This is a man named Jonathan Edwards. Anybody know who Jonathan Edwards was? Who was he? He's a preacher in, in, in Massachusetts. You want to know how he preached? He preached like this. By men's standards, just an average preacher who preached mostly monotonous and by reading his text. 
That's it. God said it's time for revival, my friends. And he gave that message sinners in the hands of an angry God. And for two years, from 1739 to 1741, revival broke out on the East Coast. Up and down the East Coast. And it didn't end there because there were 50 men who left that area of Massachusetts after they got saved. And they went down into the Carolinas. And they started churches. They started in one hour. They'd go 50 miles. They started another church. And another hour. And another church. And another hour. And another church. All the way out into Kansas, Missouri. That's why it's today. But it's not Kansas and Missouri. But it's now the Bible built. Still, today, 200 years later, 250 years, 60, 70 years later, I wish to live low. Before God is in the dust. That I might be nothing, and that God might be all. That I might become as a little child. This is how God gives John Evans. Keep going, I'll give you another one. I'm not going all the way through these. We'll have to do these another time. But I'm going to give each one is a man named John Wesley. John Wesley's mother, Susanna, and her husband had how many children? Uh, 19. Only nine of those made it past infancy, by the way. Two of those were named, one was named Charles, another was named John. Uh, a lot of the hymns that we sing are done by Charles Wesley. Uh, John Wesley was a great preacher, preached throughout Europe. He took the call. He came to America. He went to the Georgia colonies and, and over in that area, and he preached the gospel. He was a man who uh, was instrumental in, in breaking away from the Anglican church and starting what we know as the Methodist church. Not today. The Methodist church of today is anything like the one John Wesley started. Right. It's changed as well. But he began this church. He started a, a, what they call the Holy Club Society at their college. Could you imagine you and them having that today? Right. How about another man, a man named George Whitfield? George Whitfield was exactly the opposite in preaching to John Wesley He said, I'd rather wear out than rust out. I like that. Don't you? Don't sit around and do absolutely nothing while your joints still move. Move them. Right? And you can walk, walk. You can talk, talk. You can do things, do them. Anytime you won't be able to. He was called the greatest preacher since the Apostle Peter. He preached at least 18,000 times to about 10 million people. And he could never understand. Said, I don't understand all these people are here. Why did they come to hear me? He was a humble man. Just like these other men, he was a humble man. He would preach, he would preach, he would preach, he more on him later. A man named George Whitfield during this time frame. He also helped the Wesley start uh, uh, the churches there. He helped the Presbyterian Church uh, in, in, uh, in Scotland and England, the same thing. He was an ordained deacon in the Anglican Church, but he began preaching and, and it didn't hang around too long. I'll give you more on him later as well, because we're just about out of time. Remember, how about a man named William Carey? Was Joel back there? Yep. Yeah, Joel's here. But he can't come up because he's working on something else. I've got two men here that I'm going to share. One is a man named William Carey. Took the gospel to Burma in the late 1700s. This young man, by the way, was he went to a board meeting and uh, Let's see if I have the cloak in here still. I, I, I hope I do. Uh, let's see if I've got it. If I don't. Uh, he said this, expect great things from God, attempt great things for God. But Kerry, I, I don't see it here, but, but and he was challenged not to go, but he went. He went to an area, by the way, his family, his, his wife got ill, she died. His, one of his children died. It was not easy for William Carey. But the gospel had not been to India, to Burma. And he took it there. Single-handedly. A couple guys along with him. They took it there. And Joel's here today because the gospel was preached in the area that he lives by a man named William Carey. Amen. Generations ago. Just do it. Just go. I'm going 
get to heaven someday, and I'm going to find out about some man who preached to some guy over here, to some guy here, to some guy here, who told a preacher who led me to Jesus Christ. You may not lead a soul to Christ while you're here, but one day in heaven, there may be countless thousands. Forget it. Just go do it. Expect great things from God. Attempt great things for God. A man named Ed and I were Judson. God's plan, because gospel speaking, for church plan and purpose, command through the suffering of his people. All of these men, he, he again, he, he, he took the Bible out and uh, he, he gave it to others. Dr. David Livingstone, and I, I need to keep going. Where did he take the gospel to? Africa, that's right. He ran through some very difficult times here, but he didn't stop. If I, I am serving Christ from shooting a buffalo for my men or making an observation, even if some will consider it not sufficiently or even at all missionary. He went there and he led tribes and people in Africa to the Lord Jesus Christ. He established what we have today, missionary places for missionaries to go. His sidekick was a name, a name of what? Mr. Stanley, I presume. Right? Not the Livingstone, I presume. Right? Uh, we'll get into that as we go through. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give some of these to our, our teenagers. And during uh, Mission Month, I'm going to have them take about 10 minutes and present each one of these missionaries. If you want to be part of that, let me know. There's also a man named Dwight L. Moody. Born in Massachusetts, in Chicago, and preached the gospel all over his great evangelist. All of these men born during the 17 and 1800s, during this time frame. We had men like uh, uh, David Livingstone, I, I, I missed one in here, okay? Let me see if I've got it, let me know if I don't. Uh, we had Ananiah and Judson and others. So, I've gone over time tonight, and I want you to see something that this church was commended because it took out the gospel. It saw an open door, and it did what it was supposed to do. I asked our, our young people to work on the bus. I said, do you ever just go down here to Nancy Park? There's kids playing down here all the time. Take some church materials. Stop. Ask them, look, is your mom here? I'd like to talk to her about having you guys get on a bus and come to church. You see, God opens doors all the time. God opens the doors and we walk right past it. Right? Yeah. It's an open door. We don't even see it. We're so into ourselves and everything else, we walk right past it. Look for the open doors. And let God work through you. I want to be like the church in Philadelphia, don't you? I don't want to be Sardis. I don't want to be Thyatira. I don't want to be Ephesus. I want to be Philadelphia. The church is doing what God wants us to do. And He's called us to do. Let's have our invitation that a, a pianist come and play. Maybe tonight God spoke to you. Look at I, I need to be doing what I'm supposed to be doing. Maybe there's somebody at work you want to pray for. I'd be really uh, good was talking about that. Next week starts our revival. Should we pray for revival? Pray that God will revive our church, revise our land, revive our land, and pray for revival. Pray that God's hand will move. By the way, is revival for lost people or saved people? It's for saved people, not for, not for lost people. Holy Spirit's got to revive the dead. Right? We need revival. We need Lord, we thank you for this time. We pray now that you'll that just use this. Um, time of invitation for those who need to come for it. Lord, there may be some watching tonight, maybe someone here who's never truly saved. Can they come and make that right with you? Maybe it's to join our church, maybe it's baptism, or may the Spirit move amongst us in Christ's name we ask. And there's a penis place. Come and pray.
We thank you for being here tonight. I hope you're getting some of it. There's a lot of information here. I just went through 200 years of history in 35 minutes. All right? I missed a lot. So I've got these up here, and if I get some, uh, some teenagers that would like to take one of these people, you've got a whole month to study these people out and give a little 10 minute presentation each month in the month of October. All right? We talk about that first. Look at folks. We can send missionaries, can we? Uh, we'll take the gospel and all the way we can't go to some place where we can send people to go. I wish you'll learn from these people. So, you let me know. Uh, have a great week this week. Please pray for my wife. We'll be down and we'll be here Wednesday night for service. But Thursday, we go down and she's going to have the uh, cardio version down. That's where we stop the heart. Hope we get it back going again. And uh, hope we get her back in a normal sinus rhythm. So to pray for her, we would greatly appreciate that. Pray for our drive down and our drive back. Right now we're scheduled at 7.30 in the morning on Thursday, so we have to leave about 4. Uh, my wife hasn't seen 4 o'clock in decades, okay? She is. I'm sweet, right? Anyway, we pray for us this week. Be out about it, take some tracks, take some things, go out. We've got a lot of those cars sitting there, and I noticed nobody's taking them. Take them. We've got those uh, videos on the back. They're great little ways to just, I'm afraid to talk to anybody, but take this card and watch those videos. You can do that. Amen? Amen. Amen. Father, thank you for this night. Thank you for your blessings now. Now as we leave here, you've had a good day. A good day in your house. It's been good to be in your sanctuary. But Lord, now you're sending us out into the world. And as sheep among wolves. But go and knowing that you'll take care of the enemies, you'll, you'll guide, protect us, you'll direct us in what we're to say. You'll teach us how to live that dynamic life to share Christ. Lord, let's not read what we've heard here today, here, but let's take the witness and go share it with other people. I'll praise you tonight. Lord, we'll be back here on Wednesday for another service in Christ's name. Amen. Missed any notes?